Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Secretary French is here to provide our weekly education update. I want to start with a few announcements and comments. First, as you may have seen, yesterday we announced the reopening of three more DMV branches. Offices in Bennington, Newport, and Springfield will now be open for in-person transactions by appointment only. This is in addition to the Montpelier, South Burlington, and Rutland offices we opened last month. I want to remind folks that many services have been and still can be done online, over the phone, or through the mail. And we encourage people to continue using the, uh, these options when possible. But for those who need in-person help, this is very good news. Next, I want to take a few minutes to let Vermonters know I understand how stressful and troubling this time is for our country, including the news that President Trump and the First Lady have tested positive for COVID-19. My th thoughts are with the President, his family, and the many people he may have come in contact with recently. It's a reminder that this virus knows no boundaries, and we have to remain vigilant in order to remain safe. With all this uncertainty, it's up to each of us to try, try to find a way to come together as Vermonters and Americans and help one another during these difficult times. This pandemic has tested our strength over and over again. The fear for our own health and the health of our families and friends. The economic impacts that many uh, have been put out of work, making it difficult for family and businesses to make ends meet and seeing the closed doors on too many of our small businesses. And all this is happening while for weeks we had to stay home to stay safe. And unfortunately, we still need to limit our get-togethers and keep our distance from one another. I know this has taken a toll on many. Adding to this is the national atmos atmosphere that's so polarized, leaving some feeling like we'll never heal. But we will. Because we're strong, our institutions are strong, and there's still so much more that unites us than divides us. So let's focus on the areas where we agree and stop dwelling on where we don't. Let's give each other the benefit of the doubt, knowing we all bring different experiences and perspectives to the table. Let's listen to and learn from each other. And above all else, even if you can't set your differences aside, Let's be kinder to each other. There's no doubt about it. These are unusual times, but we can get through them by coming together, rising above our challenges, and lifting each other up. Fortunately, we all live in Vermont, and it's one of the most beautiful times of the year for us. So I hope that many of you can take some time this weekend before it comes to an end, which will be all too soon, Maybe get yourself a maple creamy. Enjoy the foliage, visit a state park, climb our beautiful mountains. Whatever you can do to take care of yourselves because your mental health is important as well. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Fresh for his update. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Uh, our schools are now operating at step three. Step three requires schools to implement uh, still the strict mitigation uh, strategies that we created um, to offer in-person instruction, but step three gives them greater flexibility in doing so. Our transition to step three has gone smoothly. Uh, we are still seeing only a few cases of COVID-19 in our schools, and the move to step three, I think, can be seen as a natural progression in operations. As anticipated, uh, we're also seeing schools move to more in-person instruction as they become more confident in implementing our health requirements. This week, uh, we launched our first monthly survey to understand how schools are offering in-person or remote instruction or some combination of the two under a hybrid model. We will use the data from the survey to observe the trends and to make decisions about possible future guidance. The results of the survey will be published on the Agency of Education website. Uh, the move to Step 3 allowed interscholastic competitions to begin for fall sports this weekend, 
Uh, my impression was that these competitions went very well. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that it's important that spectators and participants follow the required health guidance when attending these competitions in support of our students. Uh, this week I met with members of our school uh, nutrition association. Under step three, uh, schools may begin to use their cafeterias again. Our school meals programs have been doing excellent work during this emergency. The governor's initial order closing schools in March specifically addressed the necessity of continuing to provide school meals during the emergency, not only for nutrition purposes, but also for the economic and social stability these meals bring to families. Our school meal programs have been in continuous operation since March, including school and summer vacations, and when schools have been operating under remote and hybrid models. To date, uh, our school meal programs have provided over 5.5 million meals uh, during this emergency. Continuous operations of our meal programs have not only been easy, uh, has not been easy from a regulatory standpoint. We have needed regulatory flexibility uh, to distribute meals to the homes of students, to access federal reimbursements and federal supplies. Uh, in total, uh, the Agency of Education has submitted over 35 waiver requests to the USDA uh, to ensure the needs of our students can be met. I will say our school nutrition staff are well known for their innovation and problem solving abilities uh, since on a daily basis they have to serve meals to thousands of students. Uh, during this emergency, the frequent changes in regulations, uh, coupled with the significant lo logistical challenges related to implementing our health guidance, uh, have tested their abilities to the max. Uh, but their dedication to our students have been nothing short of outstanding. Uh, moving to step three provides them some additional flexibility to meet the needs of our students. I had a question at last week's press conference uh, which asked uh, essentially about what comes after step three, um, inferring that there might be a step four or step five. Our health guidance only has three steps. Uh, step one is when the state closes all schools like we saw in the spring. Steps two and three speak to schools being open with some form of in-person instruction, uh, with step two having the highest levels of precautions, and step three providing additional flexibility. It's a fair question, however, about what are the next steps or where do we go from here in our education system now that we have safely reopened our schools. Uh, certainly a big part of what we will continue to do is to focus on implementing our health guidance. This remains a precondition for any educational activity since all schools must be able to operate in a safe manner. Another component of our ability to maintain safety is flexibility. As a state, uh, Vermonters have demonstrated their ability to work together to suppress the virus, but we have designed our school reopening plans based on the assumption that these conditions could change at any time. By design, we included the ability to toggle between step levels in our mitigation strategies and gave school districts the additional flexibility to move between and among in-person, remote, and hybrid learning based not only on a consideration of the health conditions but also on their unique logistical situations. So safety will remain the most important job right now particularly as we start to move indoors with the advent of flu season. Um, and just by way of a reminder, please ask um, everyone to get a flu shot this year to help our schools stay open. We will continue to refine our health guidance and related procedures. Uh, the few cases we have seen have allowed us to work um, and better understand how schools and the Department of Health will work together to contain the virus and communicate with com families in their communities. While continuing to address safety considerations, we'll now put a renewed focus on the essential work of educating our students, which is why in-person instruction is so critical. We have heard from Dr. Bell and other medical experts about the importance of in-person instruction from a health perspective, but there are also compelling educational reasons why in-person instruction should be a priority in our next step, or what I would call phase three in our emergency response and education. The first phase of our response in March was a true emergency response. We had to take swift action and literally shut down our schools overnight. That work was successful. The goal back then was not necessarily educational, however. It was about preventing our healthcare system from being overwhelmed and suppressing the virus. We know the remote learning systems we rapidly deployed back in the spring were imperfect at best, and the learning needs of all students were negatively impacted. But that rapid action allowed us to achieve a high degree of suppression of the virus, which bought us the important time necessary to plan over the summer to move to phase two, which was the reopening of our schools. The planning work over the summer to reopen our schools was significant and required all of our capacity to focus on this important work. 
This meant that in many cases, our typical summer educational programming to support the learning needs of students, especially some of our most vulnerable students, did not occur. Phase two, or the reopening of our schools, has so far been very successful since we have seen very few cases of the virus. And not only have we reopened our schools safely, but we also have prepared them to operate in the dynamic conditions of the months ahead. Our schools have the tools, and now they have the operational fluency to respond to changing conditions of the virus in their operations. Safely operating our schools in these dynamic conditions is a necessary precondition for the next phase, phase three, which is about addressing the educational needs of our students. And all that this implies, including feeding them, attending to their emotional needs, holding athletic competitions, celebrating the arts, and of course, academics. Meeting the educational needs of our students is now the priority. We cannot afford to lose another six months of instructional time. This is why in-person instruction is so critical. Everything we have done to date in phase one and phase two is about getting to this point where we can safely operate our schools so we can begin to address the needs of our students. In the coming weeks, our teachers will begin to assess the impact of this emergency on the education of our students. This assessment, to a large extent, depends on the daily in-person contact between students and their teachers. This, these in-person relationships are not only critical for academic success, but also for the healthy development of our students. Our school districts are also now starting to work at modifying academic programming to meet the needs of students where they are and to chart a course for the coming months. This iterative process of teaching, learning, and adapting curriculum is also highly dependent on in-person interactions. In summary, we have learned a lot in the last six months. We have learned how to suppress the virus. We have also learned how to operate our schools safely in these conditions. Now we will apply what we have learned to address the educational needs of our students during this pandemic. Uh, thank you. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thanks, Secretary French, <clears throat> and thanks for the uh, plug for public health as well. So as of this morning, we are at 1,768 total cases. We continue to have small numbers of new cases in the setting of thousands and thousands of tests. Thus, we continue to have a low test positivity rate. We remain at 58 deaths with zero deaths recorded in 66 days. We're not currently following any significant cases, clusters, or outbreaks in colleges or school settings. There are no updates regarding the skilled nursing facility in Rutland County, nor any correctional facilities. And earlier this week, we were relieved to learn that the Vermonters currently housed in Mississippi who had been COVID-19 negative remain so in follow-up testing. I put this graph up today uh, to illustrate a point. <clears throat> You'll notice in the past week, we're very low in the single digit numbers of cases with a spike overnight. And you'll see historically over time, we have long periods with low numbers of cases and then occasional spikes. Every time we see something like that, these are almost always associated with cases that are in congregate living settings or like now group activities. In this case, a golf tournament in Bennington, <clears throat> which has led to a small number of cases in Vermont and across the New York State border. There are five total cases associated with the event held over the weekend of September 19th, three of them in Vermonters. Possibly more from overnight. These cases are now being reconciled in terms of the data. And we'll know more about them later today. Many of them not being uh, Vermont residents. Our health teams have provided isolation guidance for those people who were cases. And they've identified close contacts so they can quarantine to prevent further spread of the virus. We consider others who attended the event to have a lower risk of being exposed to the virus. But because of the number of people involved, we did reach out yesterday evening to everyone who attended 
to let them know of this low risk exposure. We're working closely with the organizers of the Fall Foliage Tournament at Mount Anthony Country Club who were able to provide us with contact information for those who attended. More than 80 people who attended the event, both in Vermont and out of state, received a text from the Department of Health linking to a letter with health information and guidance. That's a tool that we use regularly in outbreak investigations as it is an efficient way to get people the information that they need directly from the health department. We're asking the attendees to closely follow our prevention guidance, including staying home if they feel sick and calling their health care provider if they develop symptoms. We're also asking them to consider getting tested for COVID-19 even if they don't have symptoms. And we're working closely with other state health departments to provide information they need. I'd like to take a moment to thank the organizers of the event for their cooperation and support in the investigation. As I've said before, no matter what the facility or the event, we know that sometimes we will see cases. It is just the nature of the virus. But this is a reminder, as Dr. Fauci told us, that despite all of our good work here in Vermont, things can change quickly if we're not careful. Just look at what's happened with the wedding event in Maine to be instructed further by that. The bottom line is, whenever anyone is planning to go out or attend an event, take a moment to think about where you're going and assess your own level of risk and your comfort with that level. It's important to know if you'll be able to maintain six-foot spacing, if everyone will indeed be wearing masks, and if the event will be crowded, even if it is outdoors. Keeping all of these factors in the front of your mind will help you lower your own personal risk. For those on either side of the southwestern Vermont border, who are concerned about their risk or any symptoms, please connect with your health care provider. And please know there will be testing available at Bennington Rescue on Monday. And through our partners, who are great partners in the testing effort at Southwest Vermont Medical Center, where there will not be a separate pop-up, but where I've been told they will have their usual hours and extend them further. The last topic I'd like to discuss today is antigen testing. <clears throat> For some time, we've been discussing the role of antigen testing in Vermont. Yesterday, we at the Health Department provided guidance to the Vermont clinical community regarding these technical terms. In technical terms, antigen tests detect specific proteins on the surface of the virus as opposed to the tests we usually talk about, PCR tests, which actually detect the ribonucleic acid, the RNA of the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. We continue to adhere to the updated definition put forth by the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists for cases. This case definition states that detection of SARS-CoV-2 by an antigen test is considered presumptive laboratory evidence of infection, and that detection using PCR is confirmatory laboratory evidence of infection. This policy is similar to many other states. In other words, we treat a positive antigen test as a probable case of COVID-19. As I've said before, antigen tests are intended for people with symptoms of COVID, and though they are less sensitive than PCR tests, meaning they can have a higher false negative rate, they can be very helpful during the first five or more days of symptoms, depending upon the test, as this is when the viral load is generally the highest. <clears throat> they perform best when the individual has the symptoms that are most consistent with COVID, and when the prevalence of COVID in the community is high which means that the pretest probability of the disease is high at that time. 
And of course, the speed of getting a result makes the test potentially advantageous at times like these. For these reasons, the appropriate uses for antigen testing could be for symptomatic patients in a primary care setting, or also for patients being admitted to a hospital that has limited access to rapid PCR testing and needs to make a quick decision regarding triage and PPE. Now, one of the reasons these tests are in the news at this time has to do with the federal government's announcement that they have procured both antigen test instruments and tests on a large scale and are distributing them to long-term care facilities across the country, including Vermont. Now, in these settings, they could have two potential uses. If a skilled nursing facility is in the midst of an outbreak of COVID-19 in a high prevalence area and had staff or residents who developed symptoms compatible with COVID-19, the use of rapid antigen testing could allow immediate isolation and quarantining to occur. And indeed, the first states to receive these machines for these purposes were states that were undergoing a surge in cases. The other use the government has advocated for is screening, which is using it for residents or staff who don't have any symptoms. Now, we believe if done correctly, such tests could be valuable here as well. However, this must be done as part of a regular screening program, that is, testing with sufficient frequency at least once or twice a week, as this helps offset the lowest sensitivity in such a setting and the potential to have false negative results. When used in this way, at a time when the pretest probability is actually pretty low, any positive result would require confirmation by a subsequent PCR test. Though, of course, the person with the positive antigen test would be treated at that time as a probable case and isolated while awaiting that further result. Now, as I've noted all along, antigen tests do have a potential role in Vermont's testing scheme. They may play less of a role in our current low prevalence state than they might at a time when the prevalence is higher. And of course, that's a circumstance we're all trying hard to prevent. Either way, if the clinical community uses them in an informed manner, like any test for any disease, they can be very helpful tests in our overall management of this pandemic. And with that, I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Um, you know, that's uh, to be determined. This has hit us very, very quickly uh, as a country. Um, you know, again, our thoughts are with uh, his family and all those who he came in contact with over the last uh, couple of weeks um, and certainly hope for their speedy recovery. Um, but we'll see. You know, it, it, a lot uh, I don't know about the, uh, the campaign events uh, in terms of the debates and so forth. So um, we'll, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, it's happening in real time. And I guess my next question is, are you or maybe Secretary Smith um, it's getting colder out? Does, does the state have a plan like we did last year to house uh, homeless individuals and also maybe give me a sense of how much that plan might cost? Yeah, I, I believe we still are. Um, the plan is still in place. Uh, we're still continuing with that. Um, but I'll let Secretary Smith answer that. Calvin, we, we never really dismantled the program that we had, recognizing that um, we housed a lot of individuals in the hotel motel program. As you know, we have a uh, program where we're trying to move people into permanent housing, but that's not going to happen overnight. So you will see the hotel motel program continue through the winter months, 
and then the easing off of that program as we move into uh, the governor's um, the governor used coronavirus relief funds to build more housing uh, in order to to move people out of those hotels into more permanent housing. So um, that's where we are right now. And just a quick uh, on, on a side note as well, um, a few weeks back you mentioned that the state is planning on sort of rebooting one care and all care model. Today we're hearing that there's going to be you know some demonstrations urging your administration to to adopt the model. Uh, I'm wondering where, where we are with, with that plan. <coughs> Sure, I can give you a glimpse of it. Um, you know, we're stor still about 40 to 45 days out from when we're going to be um, sort of uh, working with the other partners. There's, there's uh, obviously three signatories to that uh, agreement. There's the Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, myself, the Governor, and uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, and I have to work with it, to make it successful, I should work with all three of those individuals. I think what you'll see is that we're looking into sort of three buckets of what we need to examine. The first bucket is at the federal level. What do we need uh, from the federal government to make this successful? Uh, there may be some adjustments that we have to do. There may be some things, especially in the Medicare program, of what we have to do. Number two, uh, what do we have to do internally um, in terms of those, those sort of structural and operational aspects internally, both at AHS and across state government to, uh, to enhance the success of the all-payer model? And then third, what do we have to do externally? And when you talk externally, I think you know I'm talking about the ACO, One, one Care. What do we have to do uh, in that aspect? So without, you know, that's how we've broken up the work in order to look at this over the next, uh, uh, you know, 45 days. And we think, um, you know, we'll, we'll come together with a plan that's going to be um, redirectional, I think is, is the word. Reboot is what I've used, but, you know, it's, it, it's a good word. We just really need to take the theoretical, and I've said this before and many times, um, I've seen the all-payer model work during the height of the pandemic. It was probably the single most effective um, instrument that we had in order to get prospective payments out to uh, the healthcare uh, institutions to avoid any collapse of healthcare during the time of the pandemic. So I've seen it work. So. What we need to do now, and I've said this before, is take the theoretical and make it better operationally, and, I, and uh, that's what we intend to do. David? Well, the good news is I signed the budget, came in early this morning and uh, went through that and, uh, and signed the budget, so that's done. Um, but there are a number of other bills uh, that are on, on my desk, so to speak, uh, that I have until I think it's Tuesday or Wednesday, or some maybe Monday, but there's uh, another couple on Tuesday or Wednesday. So I'll have the weekend uh, to reflect on that and uh, determine what I do from here. So out of the 13, six were tests performed in Bennington County. So we can only conjecture if they actually were from the event or had nothing to do with the event. Um, we have the five original cases that I mentioned in my presentation today, and then we have whatever percentage of these additional ones are related to the event. Um, and again, these are not all Vermont, and they require uh, cooperation and work in tandem with other states. So I can't really give you much of an update because literally these labs are done at night, they go in the report, and then all the investigation occurs the next day. Sure, all right, 
are you able to, um, of the Vermonters who have tested positive from there so far, say if those are at least um, uh, contained to the southern part of the state or, or speak regionally to that at this point? I, I can't really tell you what their place of residence, no. And one other question, following up from uh, something uh, yesterday, I was working on, there's a private company, Garnet, that's working on what I believe, if I have it right, is droplet digital PCR testing, DB PCR, that they would like to, if they get approval, offer um, uh, for people that would be willing to pay for it. Um, if somebody came into Vermont, was required to quarantine, and got a negative result from a DB PCR test, would that be satisfactory to the health department to, to shorten their quarantine? Yeah. I found out about that yesterday and started looking up that test. And my impression of that test is it is not one that is rapid, so I have to find out more about it uh, because the reading I did showed that it required the same kind of turnaround going to a lab. But I know that much of what Garnett does is point of care, uh, so I have to reconcile those two things. So I, I can't give you a firm answer on that. Um, but if it's, it, it, no, it is an FDA, EUA approved uh, test. And if it's of the traditional type, um, that, would, that would qualify for sure. Uh, but I don't know if it's a point of care one. And that's what I have to find out more about. Thank you. And David, I just pulled the exact date. We received the marijuana bill yesterday. So it's not due until Wednesday. Gotcha. OK. Uh, actually. Probably get you since you were talking about their net. They're, they're the ones who are supposedly moving into the, uh, if you will, a retail space up in the uh, Burlington Airport. Um, just in in, uh, in talking with their representative yesterday, they were saying something about they're going to have super quick turnarounds, uh, you know, within 24 to 48 hours. Um, but it is a pay pay service uh, if you're jumping on an airplane or you're getting off an airplane rather short enough here. Uh, is that something we're going to see down the, in the future if you folks are uh, OK with it? Uh, you know, sort of retail shops around the, around the state uh, providing these things? Yeah, again, um, you know, we're giving the clinical community the kind of guidance they need to understand how these tests are best uh, mobilized and used. Um, one of the tests they're going to be offering is antigen tests. And uh, there may be valid reasons to use it on people who are walking through to, that want to access that test right at that time. Um, we just need to be careful with the interpretation of the results. Um, I don't believe we are as much in charge of approving if, if it goes in the airport as the city of Burlington is, uh, to be honest. Um, and um, just like when an urgent care or a primary care practice wants to have a certain technology, uh, as long as they go through the proper CLIA and other regulatory processes, uh, that's what's required for them to do. Um, so you may be seeing more of this. Um, my hope is that the pandemic doesn't last so long that we need to continue to see more and more of this. But there's certainly opportunities for people to try to provide testing. And, you know, we've been inviting people to help us part, partner with us for testing, um, knowing that at some point, if there were surges and what have you, we need to protect our own capacity in the state lab and some of the labs we're using, like at UVM, and want to have as many partners as possible offering authorized tests that could be useful to the population. So I have no, I have no problem with that part. Okay, and, and just a quick follow-up, the, uh, the public uh, will be able to trust these things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, as long as the, they are aware of themselves, do they have symptoms, do they not have symptoms, is this the appropriate test for them at that time? Um, I'm sure that the processing and the technical aspects of doing the test, they can be very trusting. Uh, these are made pretty user friendly. And I, I would think that that would be trusting at all. So again, um, I think they're going to be offering flu testing too, which is something that uh, labs and healthcare facilities use. You know, I just caution the public, and this is not anything against what's going on. Um, it's often very hard to isolate out um, doing something like getting a test 
uh, from your overall health care uh, and being looped in you know, appropriately with a health care system um, so that you, you can get advice as to what might be the most appropriate course of action for you to take. So that's the only concern I have um, with any kind of testing that's set up anywhere. Uh, and again, I don't want people to think that testing is prevention. The message is really uh, all of the practices I talked about uh, are prevention with the six foot spacing, avoiding the crowds, wearing the mask, uh, having a test at a moment in time uh, is not unfortunately a, a prevention practice. Thank you. Pat, WCAS. Hi, this question is likely for Secretary French. Does the state have any broader assessment of our school air handling systems than they did this summer? And are you concerned about how adequate these systems are for in-person learning in the winter months? And then I'm gonna have a follow-up question after that. Uh, thank you. No, we don't really have an assessment. Uh, it does vary, as you know, from school to school. Uh, we do have a program under the coronavirus relief funds that are it's being administered by Efficiency Vermont, so we know uh, I think the original pot of money for that program was $6.5 million, and the legislature uh, subsequently uh, added some to that. But we know that that really is to do exactly kind of what you're alluding to, which is this, this assessment of, of the condition of a lot of these systems. Um, I think to your question about do I have concerns, yes, I think as we go inside more, as the winter uh, comes and the you know, temperatures get colder, uh, indoor air quality is, is one of the elements that we address in our health guidance, but it's just one of the elements. So there's ways that districts can address that. Uh, certainly attending to their mechanical systems is important, but they also have windows, fans, and so forth that can be utilized as well. Uh, but it is, it's gonna be an increased cause for concern as we get into the colder weather and people are inside more. And you mentioned that CARES Act money. How many schools applied for it and is all the money gone? Um, I don't have the specific numbers with me. Um, I will say there, we did a sort of a survey around the 1st of uh, September to get a, a broader assessment of what the need was, and that resulted in the legislature putting more money into, um, into that pot, so to speak. And as you just heard, the governor signed the budget, so uh, we'll, be, we'll be working with districts to ensure that money gets out to them. And is that money still with a deadline of the end of the year? Yeah, it's CRF or Coronavirus Relief Fund. Currently, the federal uh, limitation on that is December 30th. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Lisa, the AP. Uh, thanks. This is also a question for Secretary French. Um, as we move towards from phase two to phase three, uh, will this affect hybrid? models that some schools are using right now? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think, you know, we will see an increased focus on in-person instruction. As I mentioned, uh, I think it's, we, we understand in the education community that that in-person is, is, is more effective. Um, and I outlined a couple of reasons why today. You know, firstly, this, uh, this aspect of doing an assessment of student learning and that refers to, I would say broadly, the more general assessment activities, just teachers exercising their professional uh, experience and wisdom. Um, so I think, you know, yes, I think over time we'll see hybrid learning still certainly be utilized, but there's elements of it that I think could be leveraged to improve in-person instruction as well, particularly what we call asynchronous learning, uh, meaning that teachers can deploy resources uh, into their remote learning platforms and utilize those to support in-person instruction. So for example, as I, I think I referred earlier this summer, of a tech center uh, that was filming some of their demonstrations and putting them into the learning management system, firstly to satisfy the remote learning interest, but that, that equally can be important for in-person instruction as well. You can say to a student, go watch the video, and the student can pull that up at their leisure and watch that over and over if they'd like, um, and have, <clears throat> have the in-person lessons be reinforced by the use of the technology. So there is a relationship, um, but I expect uh, schools, uh, as I mentioned, have, have the flexibility now to deploy a couple new tools than what they had previously, and that will be helpful in the dynamic conditions in front of us. Okay, and how quickly do you see this happening? Is this going to be a very gradual process or uh, moving into phase three? 
Well, I'm using the term phase three just sort of to, to draw a line between uh, so much of our activity, which was about reopening schools. Um, and I, the way I think about that is, you know, reopening, uh, you know, significant logistical undertaking, but it was a means to an end, not an end in itself. Um, so we're just trying to message the system and point it back to um, certainly what, it, what our purpose is, which is education, but with the understanding sort of foundationally uh, that in this, this situation, we have to attend to the safety first. Um, but that in itself, um, you know, the logistics that have been involved in that, but incredible are not necessarily the goal we've been working towards. The goal is to reopen the schools safely so that we can then begin to address the educational needs of our students. Okay, thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Eric, Times Argus. All right, we're going to go to Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, thanks, Rebecca. Governor, you probably saw that the uh, Congress, the House passed another $2.2 trillion uh, front or relief package, and it, has, it would have a lot here for Vermont, including state and uh, local government funding. Have you had a chance to look at that? They, clearly, the economy has stalled uh, both, uh, I think, in fairly safe. Have you looked at that, and what would you say would be the impact if it were to actually get through the Senate and be signed by the President? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I haven't looked at it uh, in detail, uh, but, uh, but suffice it to say, uh, we're in need. Uh, the states are in need of more help from Congress in a number of different ways. And uh, while I'm encouraged uh, to see this passing uh, the House, uh, it doesn't appear uh, to have uh, much opportunity uh, to pass the Senate. So um, at this point in time, uh, I'm, what I'm hearing from from many uh, in the uh, in, in the DC's you know, aura is that uh, nothing is going to happen until after the election, which is unfortunate because uh, we need to start planning now. We could use, uh, as I've said before, uh, more flexibility in the existing CARES practice uh, care package. Uh, that would be helpful uh, to us. Uh, but, again, in the future, uh, we could use some help uh, in terms of uh, budgetary help, uh, municipal budgets, uh, as well as with, as I've said before, uh, with broadband. Uh, as we've heard uh, in some of the questions today, uh, we, could, uh, we could use some help with infrastructure, with the air handling devices in our schools. Um, so there's, a, there's still a lot of need out there. Uh, and, uh, and I believe that Congress needs to act in order uh, to, to help us in that regard. Yeah, a lot of people probably haven't heard about this, but it would restore that $1,200 individual payment, the $600 uh, coronavirus unemployment, and uh, $800 million for Vermont state local government. So I guess we'll wait and see to what happens there. Yeah, it would be a significant boost, obviously, uh, to our economy, and it's been essential uh, to this uh, reaction to the pandemic, as well as, uh, you know, so that we can survive. We've done well as a state. Uh, and, uh, and I appreciate uh, the good work of the congressional delegation, particularly Senator Leahy. Uh, Senator Leahy was one uh, who put uh, the Small States Initiative into place uh, before the pandemic in anticipation of areas like this when a lot of small states uh, would suffer uh, if it's per capita. So uh, with his good work uh, over the years, we've been able to uh, take advantage of that, and it's been really impactful uh, for us as a state, and, uh, and I thank him for that. Right, great, thanks, Governor. Greg, the County Courier. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor, can you find me here, Mitch? Yes, we can. Okay, Governor. Um, I wanted to uh, first ask, uh, I know it came up in the debate last night, uh, Act 250 bill, are you uh, at a place where you can say if you're going to sign or veto that? Uh, no, I still have some time. I'll be reflecting on that over the weekend. Um, but, uh, but again, I was disappointed with the results. It really is just a shadow of itself. It ended up with just two initiatives. One uh, was the forest fragmentation. 
Um, the Vermont Association of Snow Travelers has, uh, has, uh, has concerns about that. They've heard some, some of the landowners where the trails go across uh, their property who are uh, threatening to shut uh, the trail system down if it, uh, if it moves forward. Uh, the other uh, part of the bill uh, was just a, an extension of uh, time for uh, the, the trails, uh, the light, um, mainly uh, you know, Kingdom trails would be affected by this, but it's just a one year extension. It doesn't do anything to help. Our initiative uh, was uh, to uh, allow for trails to be developed without Act 250, uh, and uh, this really uh, just gives an extension more time to determine that. Uh, so I don't think that's uh, effective, but I'll look it over over the weekend. I know that uh, there's a lot of concern, obviously, uh, for Kingdom Trails in particular, uh, but um, but I don't think it was a good deal uh, in the long run. Uh, and we need to we need to have let the legislature go back and uh, and take the at least start with the House bill and improve from there, uh, because they really didn't address all the issues that uh, we had a lot of buy-in from the environmental community on, in terms of the downtowns and and some of the help there uh, to revitalize the downtowns as well, and the the trails, uh, a permanent solution to the trail network. Okay, uh, the other update I was going to ask about is uh, it was mentioned a few weeks ago that come October we we start talking about winter sports in, in high school. Uh, I've heard rumors that hockey might be conducted outside. Uh, I'm wondering what's being discussed at the state level as far as winter sports. Yeah, I know there's uh, there's a team uh, who are active uh, in determining that. Uh, Secretary Moore is uh, leading that, but she's not on the call today, unfortunately. Uh, but we'll try and get more information for you uh, next week. But uh, but I know that uh, I know they're they're talking uh, and trying to determine. Of where we'll go from here. Uh, some sports will happen, others uh, probably won't, uh, but uh, uh, having sports outside uh, is more beneficial, but we'll see which ones uh, we'll be able to, uh, to continue. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, I think this is a quick one. Um, I've heard of a few restaurants that are not uh, keeping track of, you know, documenting who their customers are every time people come in. Um, I, I'm wondering if the state, when they do their periodic checks and, and inspections for restaurants, if they are doing a quick audit to, to determine if, if these restaurants are actually uh, writing down their customers' names and contact numbers. I, I actually don't have the answer to that. Um, I don't know if uh, Secretary Curley or uh, Commissioner Sherling uh, is on, but maybe one of the two could answer that. Uh, I am on, Governor. Uh, sorry, Lindsay, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, we haven't um, done, you know, any kind of formal auditing, but I can say that um, personal experiences and my own um, inquiries, checking around, I think that the restaurants are doing a really great job at taking the name and number of at least the head of the party on the reservation. Um, we at ACCD have not received any reports of non-compliance, but um, certainly if, if there's somebody that has a concern and needs a check-in, we're happy to provide some education. And I would definitely um, look to Commissioner Sherling to see if anything has come to public safety on this. So uh, I, I went to a restaurant in Orleans County yesterday, uh, and they did not ask for a name or contact number, and, and so I asked them if they were doing that, and they said no, they weren't bothering. So that's, that's what prompts the question. And uh, you know, I'll just add that uh, I, I don't think we've received any reports uh, along those lines relative to inspections that would happen with the health inspections. That would be a, an arm of the health department and we can follow up with them. But if you want to pass along uh, any information about non-compliance, we can certainly go out and do a, uh, an educational visit or, or work with our health partners to do that. Okay, yeah, again, I was just curious if uh, if it was something that was being done in the normal course of inspecting restaurants. So I think that's it for me today. I think, thank uh, I think thank you, Governor, for your time. Uh, thank you very much. I think the Bennington issue over the country club there um, underscores how important it is for us to maintain some sort of list so that we can contact people if there's 
some sort of a, a cluster or an outbreak uh, that we are able to uh, contact those of uh, people who may or may not be affected, but they would want to be aware. So uh, that just, uh, that's why it's so important uh, to follow the guidelines that we put into place. John, BPR. John Dillon, BPR. All right, we'll go to Ham Davis, Vermont Journal. This is a question for This is a question for Mike Smith. Can you hear me? He's right here. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the question I have is uh, goes back to an earlier question, uh, expanded on it a little bit, um, which is the question about One Care Vermont and the recent movement or pressure to actually kill kill One, one Care Vermont. Uh, and the, uh, the what you've said is that you're going to reboot the system and so forth, but irrespective of how you reboot it, one of the uh, most difficult challenges that the that it had is for various reasons is the question of scale, that is to say, how many people are attributed uh, to one care and that way getting into fixed price contracts, prospective payment contracts. My question is this, the, uh, um, I, will you, will you um, bring in, or try to bring in as soon as possible, both the state employees and the state teachers? Um, in the into the uh, into the into one care so that they can become part of the all payer model. If the if the uh, that decision has to be made by January first, and you forty five days doesn't give you much time. Are you moving to? Are you do you intend to bring in the state employees and the teachers, irrespective of how you reboot or take away the system? Um, I'll first answer part of that. Uh... Uh, and then uh, let Mike uh, answer all the open-ended questions. But uh, Ham, you're right on uh, the, t the mark. In, in a lot of respects, uh, we need more people uh, in the system in order to prove whether it can work or not. Uh, we have been, I know Secretary Young has been working uh, feverishly uh, with uh, the state employees uh, in order to get them on. Uh, we haven't got them there yet, but uh, we're still hopeful. Uh, we would love to have the teachers, uh, the education portion as well. That would be helpful. Um, and for those who, you know, we're three years into this uh, at this point, and as Secretary Smith said, we saw the benefits of the all-payer model in the, uh, in the mm -hmm. pandemic. And so we're going to continue to do all we can uh, to, to see this through. Uh, we're three years in, five-year uh, term. We're trying to uh, we, we took five years uh, to debate single payer uh, before uh, Governor Shumlin pulled the plug on that. I think we owe it uh, to everyone uh, to, to keep moving forward on the all payer model uh, for the full five years. And, uh, and I believe that it can be improved, it can work, uh, but we have to prove ourselves. And uh, maybe Secretary Smith can add to that. Ham, you bring up a really good point. In fact, I'm going to be sitting down with the state employees. I think it's towards the end of October to discuss this very point in coming into the all-payer model. Um, I will reach out to the teachers as well. I think it's important, um, as the governor had said, that to get to scale, we, we should have uh, those two entities into the all-payer model. So I'll be sitting, uh, it, it, I think it's been scheduled for the, for the state employees in October sometime, and uh, I'll be reaching out to the teacher shortly. So you're right, it has to be part of this, um, what I call a reboot, it has to be part of the reboot. Thank you, can I have one more question to uh, Dr. Levine? Sure, go ahead, Ham. Uh, uh, this is for Dr. Levine. At the risk of being tedious, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, you had one little hole in the uh, in the question in, the, in your uh, blanket um, proposition or rule or whatever you want to call it, your opinion that the antigen, the antigen test should only be used on people with 
with, with, with uh, um, evidence of the disease, symptomatic uh, patients. Well, my question is this. It seems to me that the that I understand exactly how if you can use it on asymptomatic people that you have to do it regularly and then you then they need to, it needs to happen often. But I think the, both the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas, on, is a special case because they are singular events that are not likely to be repeated. So you're going to have people whose life, ordinary people whose uh, ordinary life wouldn't subject them to uh, very all that much risk, especially in Vermont, which has such low numbers. But on those two days, Thanksgiving and Christmas, the risk can, can increase dramatically. And so it would seem to me that, you know, I'd like you to just, just let me ask one more time. Would it be possible, would you endorse using a, a, an antigen test, okay, for those two people? And I, I would just say, I, I know this person is a very powerful person in Vermont who, who might want to know the answer to that also. You made it more intriguing of a question. But at any rate, um, I still think use of the test on a one-time basis in a person with no symptoms in a place where the prevalence is very low uh, is fraught with challenge, both from the false negative and false positive aspect. And we know already, <laughs> looking at um, such examples, if you do the math on, on it, the pretest probability is very low. And even with a positive test, the post-test probability of that test being a true positive is less than a coin toss, less than 50%. Uh, so one has to exercise caution at those times. And uh, I would suggest use of the PCR test for that kind of purpose. All right. Thank you. We'll go to Lisa at the Valley Reporter. Hello, I'm back at Airbnb and other short-term rentals again. Um, we've heard from several innkeepers that Airbnb and short-term rentals are not providing guidance on their sites about the travel restrictions when coming to Vermont. And they don't provide that information to hosts or guests when those stays are booked. And this one innkeeper said, we know this firsthand as we take some bookings via Airbnb, Airbnb makes it impossible for hosts to provide links either in their listings or in their messages to guests to share the state travel guidelines. So is the state in contact with Airbnb about this issue? Um, go to Secretary Curley first and then maybe follow up with uh, Commissioner Sharling. Thank you. Yeah, hi Lisa. Um, thank you for the question. You know, we have worked with uh, the, the private registered um, platforms to ensure that they are well aware of our guidelines and our cross-state travel maps. We know that this is a difficult situation. It's not perfect. We try to publicize, or we do publicize the map weekly. Over 65% of the traffic coming to our website is for that map. And we hear, we've heard from tens of thousands of people who are interacting with the map and asking us for clarification. So um, we continue to know that folks are trying to follow and understand our guidelines. Um, we do understand that it's difficult to make sure that Airbnb and some of the other uh, private rental platforms are following the rules, um, but we continue to try to make it better and be sure that people are well aware of the expectations and the guidelines. Um, and as a follow-up, what happens, maybe it's for Secretary Curley or Secretary Shirley, what happens when people go through the process of um, reporting non-compliance? I have it open on my screen and it says, we're not monitoring this online reporting system in real time. What happens when you receive a report of non How does, what's the process? So I can take that component, Mr. Mike Shirley. Um, what happens once the, uh, reports made through the portal is it goes out to uh, another entity for follow-up and that could be a law enforcement entity, it could be a health officer, it could be another entity within a municipality depending on the nature of the report uh, for an educational follow-up. 
and then if there's an indication that uh, a problem exists and it perpetuates beyond uh, that initial educational follow-up, then uh, there could be additional contact made and or in rare instances a referral to the Attorney General's office for further contact. And relative to Airbnb, we are aware, and I've seen uh, some of the, the postings that they have sent out to Vermont hosts uh, reiterating the Vermont guidance. And I know on their webpage, I'm actually looking at it right now, you can see uh, Vermont's guidance um, and a direct link to our cross-state uh, border guidance and the, the uh, governor's executive order. Thank you both for your time. Guy Page. Thank you, Lisa. Can you tell us what discussions your administration had about saving Rutland County's legendary Thomas Derry? Um, I may refer to uh, Secretary Curley on this, uh, from, um, or I don't know if uh, Secretary Tebbets is not on. Um, that uh, that was a bit of a, a surprise to me as well, a guy. Um, but uh, but I'm not sure that unless we were having conversations uh, in house uh, with them, uh, that I, I'm not sure that uh, we were notified with any length of time. But uh, Secretary Curley, do you have any information on Thomas Derry? Um, not beyond what you just said, Governor. But I do know that Secretary Tevis may have. Um, may have a better update for you. So Guy, I'm happy to connect you with Secretary Tevis offline. That would be terrific, thank you. Uh, Governor, I, I know you're not the Secretary of State, but I, as Chief Executive, can you explain to people what will happen if a voter shows up at the polls in November and the town clerk informs this voter that a ballot was mailed in his or her name, uh, and but the voter alleges that he or she did not complete a ballot? I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, uh, guy, I don't know for sure. Uh, the Secretary of State has made it very clear that he's the expert in elections, so I would refer to him. But from my understanding, uh, and I may have this wrong, but from my understanding is uh, that uh, that as long as you haven't been checked off, that you can actually get another ballot. But that's a better question for Secretary Condos. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Andrea, seven days. Andrea? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Um, great. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, probably a question for Dr. Levine. Um, I'm seeing um, some epidemiologists who are really advocating for rapid testing as a way to do widespread frequent monitoring of the general population um, to kind of proactively catch um, cases. So I'm wondering, um, what's the rationale between focusing state monitoring efforts on the sort of um, the kind of more delayed result PCR test and under what conditions might antigens become a more key part of the Department of Health monitoring strategy? I guess, would it take kind of um, more information on the reliability of specific tests, um, any, you know, a kind of stressing of the state's lab capacity, of uh, general higher prevalence of the disease? Um, I'm trying to understand how the state is weighing these factors in thinking about antigens as a potential tool. So if I could rephrase your question just so we all understand it well. It's really, um, could a part of the state's future testing strategy be to utilize antigen testing in the vast majority of Vermonters who are asymptomatic as sort of a, uh, like an early warning system um, so that we would see trends and uh, make decisions based on using that test regularly in the population at large? Am I correct on your question? Yes. Good. Okay, yep. so, you know, that would be a valid use of the test. I can tell you our past experience without that test, but just with the PCR test, is we have abundant Vermonters who've come to pop-ups, come to our state health offices, uh, district offices, 
um, and gone to their primary care physicians uh, wanting tests, either because they wanted to get out of quarantine or because they were a contact or because they were curious about their risk. And the rate of positivity is so, so small uh, in our experience with the PCR that I'm not sure this would be a valuable exercise to just try it with a different test and, and get the same results all over again. Um, I do see it, though, as potentially useful in the day that I never want to see come, which is when our test positivity rate is higher in Vermont, or the prevalence of disease or the number of new cases on a daily basis is getting much higher, because that's a very different set scenario. And in that scenario, um, if we're perhaps trying to figure out regionally if there are differences, or uh, in different populations or different settings if there are differences, then having a strategy like that might be very useful. I can't see it playing a role in our current state of affairs. Okay. Um, thanks. And uh, as a follow-up, um, how um, how is the state going to be distributing um, the the um, hundred eighty thousand Abbott tests that are coming in from the federal government? Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, we have almost none of those tests yet, so keep that in mind. Uh, we think we're going to see 12,000 within the next week, and then the other 180,000, whatever, or 168,000 would be sometime uh, over months. Uh, so we don't really have a good understanding of when we're going to see all of those. Um, but those are the discussions we're having right now uh, because there are there are some settings where they might potentially be useful, uh, but that we might not need them in right now because we have other testing uh, strategies in place that are already set up and strategically uh, directed. So what we would probably do if we really don't need them for the settings that the government thinks we should put them in immediately, like long-term care settings, is we would uh, hold on to them and develop a strategy for the future where we could see uh, the use of them being very uh, instrumental to our testing strategy. We're also looking at uh, procurement of these on a long-term basis because the government is giving the first installment, if you will, but they have promised no further installments and left it up to states to procure them beyond that. So we need to have a good understanding of their availability. If the manufacturing is up to speed, and uh, of their cost uh, to be able to know how they fit in a long-term strategy. Because we'd hate to use uh, the first set and then find that that strategy just ended because we no longer had access to them, either because of cost or because of manufacturing pipeline issues. So stay tuned for more on that. Great, thank you. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, parts of this may be for both Dr. Levine and Secretary French. Um, wondering about reflections on the COVID scare at St. John's Free School this week. Um, have there been any lessons learned from the episode? Uh, do you anticipate this kind of scenario with a positive antigen test that ultimately gets proven negative happening in schools again? And um, do you see any adjustments to how uh, this scenario might be managed or, or uh, adapting messaging that gets delivered to the school when it, when it occurs? No, thanks. This is Secretary French. I'll let <clears throat> Dr. Levine speak to the antigen testing component of that question. Um, I did uh, meet with the superintendent. We're, we're following up regularly with superintendents as these cases emerge so we can continue to learn and improve our processes. Um, my, my sense from the superintendent was he was very pleased with the response of the Department of Health and it really was uh, very extremely useful for him in communicating with his uh, larger school community. And I believe uh, the school really experienced a minimal loss in instructional time. Uh, as a, as a, as a, that's a good indicator, I think, of how well things went. Uh, they were able to get right back in business pretty quickly. So um, I think it reinforced for him that uh, the support structures are in place to continue to operate schools safely. Just go through what happened. Just to 
give you what, what I know, and again, I'm not the healthcare provider, um, but this clearly was a case of an antigen test being performed um, in a setting actually across our border, not even within the state. Um, and we had a sort of medical debrief about this with members of the medical community in that area, uh, none of whom were responsible for the initial test, uh, only responsible for the subsequent PCR test, uh, because they were a bit disturbed by how all of the events had occurred as well. Again, this is why I talk about testing and its integration into the healthcare system. It's one thing to be asymptomatic and want to go to our pop-up, and that's fine. But for anyone else with symptoms, et cetera, we don't want to just have a test be in isolation um, when some of the symptoms might not even be the COVID symptoms that we would get the test for, or where more evaluation might need to occur for those symptoms in a, in a reasonable way with clinical judgment applied before any such tests are ordered. Uh, so I can't give a lot of details on that, except that um, clearly this was a case where uh, the person uh, themselves had to go through some, um, I'll use the word suffering, just to you know, get through the, the whole episode, and, uh, and the school system and community uh, had to contend with that. Uh, if you look at it uh, from a high level now backwards, uh, I'm actually, again, like the secretary, very pleased with how things turned out. If you think about our schools, we've had literally a handful at the most of schools that have had to actually start to make decisions about what, what do I do today? How do I implement the plan that we said we would implement if somebody in the school was positive? Um, that's a very uncomfortable thing to do for the first time. Probably will be for the second time too, for that matter. But no, you know, when you're doing something you haven't done before, uh, and you have something of the gravity of a positive case in a school setting, um, you do what you need to do. And often we found out in our experience thus far that means at least take a day to let things sort of settle out and figure them out, and. Most of the time, the schools have elected to at least not have that day be an in-person day uh, as they begin to formulate their further plan. Um, but obviously, everybody in the community suffers in some way when that happens um, and are concerned, uh, even if there really is little reason for them to be concerned because they don't have all the details either. So I think this worked out pretty expeditiously. Uh, good judgments were made by all uh, early on, and uh, then when more information was available, uh, uh, subsequent judgments could be made. So um, again, I think the experience our small numbers of schools have had so far has been a good one, uh, considering that they're breaking new ground every time for their own school, their own parents, their own community at large. Okay, uh, thank you. And if there's time, if I could um, shift topics with uh, Governor Scott. Um, just wondering if you have any thoughts on the letter from um, Senators Hassan and Shaheen and Collins and Kane um, asking the administration to uh, either open the Canadian border or at least get greater flexibility um, and their argument that it can be done safely in, in certain local conditions. Um, sure. Uh, I haven't read the letter. Uh, myself, and I would be curious as to why our congressional delegation wasn't hadn't signed on to it. Uh, maybe they um, were waiting to hear back from us, uh, but we weren't consulted in that that I know of. Um, you know what we're seeing in uh, Quebec right now. Uh, we we talked about this a little bit on Tuesday. Uh, their number of cases, and I, I'm watching them again on a daily basis, but their uh, number of positive cases has increased dramatically over the last month uh, and the uh, number of deaths continues to rise. So I, uh, I myself am a bit concerned about opening up, you know, another area of opportunity for, because we have so many traveling into the state uh, where we could be impacted. So at this point, I think uh, the strategy is, uh, is appropriate. Uh, both for Canada and for here, 
uh, in the U.S., uh, in, in particular Vermont. So I am, um, at some point in time, I'm, you know, more than open uh, to having that cross-border trade, more tourism, and our Canadian friends uh, coming to visit us. Uh, but I don't think it's today. And, uh, and I think the numbers would, uh, would back that up. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Again, it's the data and the science that we rely on uh, in making these decisions, and I think that that should drive the decision making here. All right, Joe Barton Chronicle. Uh, good, uh, good morning, Governor. Um, we got a call from a reader who asked when adult daycare centers will be reopened. The reader said there are a lot of people um, who can't go to work because they have people at home who would normally be in these settings and they can't be left alone. Uh, that is a Secretary Smith question. Joe, thank you for the question. I think what we're trying to do is um, uh, this is open these as uh, soon as possible. Obviously, we've been assessing the risk, but I think it's time, and I think everybody has agreed that we need to start opening uh, these centers in the safest and most convenient way that we can. I, I think we've been understandably cautious with how we open these, um, but we are going to open these in the, the most expeditious way that we can, and I think um, we're in the process of starting to open up these adult uh, care. I don't have a specific um, timeline for your area, but we are developing uh, guidelines. We are looking at how we sort of fund uh, those adult uh, day operations, and um, I think you'll see more to come in um, probably in the next couple of weeks. So you expect to have um, at least the guidance prepared yeah. in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, Joe, I think the guidance is prepared. I th uh, I'll have to check on it. But um, it is a priority to get these open in a safe way. Obviously, um, uh, it, this is a tricky pop proposition, but at the same time, we understand the need to um, start getting th these open so that we don't isolate um, uh, an entire population. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great, thanks. Um, there's a little bit of a preface here. Uh, is it, this goes back to 1818 with a, a novel by Mary Shelley called Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. And due to a series of, uh, of, of lab screw-ups in the U.S. at the CDC, um, the U.S. Uh, outsourced, or they halted gain-of-function research on viruses here in the U.S. And, um, in 2014. And in 2015, Dr. Fauci had outsourced to China, and he licensed the lab uh, to continue to get U.S. funding. And even though in January of 2018, the U.S. Embassy sent cables warning about the safety of the Wuhan lab and asked for help. The embassy warned that the researchers showed various SARS like coronaviruses can interact with ACE2 receptors, meaning that uh, bat coronaviruses can be transmitted to humans to cause SARS like diseases. And um, uh, I, I guess my question is. Have we learned where are the bioethicists 
Uh, have we learned nothing uh, uh, from, from dealing with stuff like this? Uh, and, 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 and haven't we, haven't, we're almost lucky that, uh, I hate to say this, but aren't we almost lucky that only 200,000 people have died and that this pandemic could have been much, much worse? I'm not sure who wants to take this, um, but I would just state the obvious. I mean, I, I believe we have learned a lot during this pandemic. Uh, this was a um, unique virus, never before seen uh, to man. And we have had to learn on the fly. The CDC uh, has had to work uh, diligently uh, in trying to anticipate what we do about this. So I, uh, Again, I think we've learned a lot, maybe not as quick as we would hope, but, um, but, but again, I think what we've seen so far has been remarkable in our testing ability, capacity, um, not just as a state, but as a country. Um, and those are the highlights. The vaccine uh, appears to be moving quicker than anything we've seen in, in modern history. Um, so I think we can, uh, you know, science is trying to catch up, but, uh, but it's, it's difficult when you have this unique virus. Yeah, but it looks like it might be that science has brought us this virus. And Governor, um, you, you say that uh, we're relying on the science, the data, and the numbers um, for reopening. Um, but what kind of science, data, and numbers would it take to, uh, to, um, to stop the state of emergency and what are you doing now that you uh, that you couldn't do, you know, without the state of emergency being in place? We wouldn't be able to have all the measures that we put into place uh, right now without the state of emergency. And we've been through this before, Steve. I mean, we look at the model here. Sure. I mean, you you saw it on Tuesday. Uh, it's starting to close in on us again. And we're seeing higher uh, positivity rates in New York. Uh, we're hearing. Uh, that they may be uh, implementing uh, stricter measures in other states surrounding us. We've seen uh, the escalation of cases in, in Canada, in Quebec in particular, Montreal. I mean, they're frequent visitors to us. So without the tools we have uh, at our disposal right now, we couldn't preclude any of that from happening to our state right here today. So um, I think the uh, everything we put into place has been essential. It's kept Vermonters safe. It's kept our our number of positive low uh, death rate, uh, again, as uh, Dr. Levine had stated today, we haven't seen a death, thankfully, uh, in over uh, 60 days. Uh, I, no other state can say that. So um, again, I don't sure. want to have this state of emergency any more than anyone else does. Uh, but until uh, other states get their uh, number of cases under control and the death rate reduced and and we get back to some sort of normal or vaccine is produced and distributed safely, it's it's a tough road ahead and with tough decisions. But um, but I don't know what I do any different uh, than we're doing today. Well, with the, with, when we had the, uh, we, we saw the, uh, the Hong Kong flu come through, I think it was in 68, and uh, it, it went around the planet once and, and, and it wiped out a lot of people. And then it, it came, it seemed to come back again in 69 and, and took out more. And then I'm not sure if it was Moore's ratchet or a diminution of the virus or, or just, you know, the, the vulnerable had been, it had been, you know, already died off from this. But that seemed to, uh, to ring the planet for like a couple of years. So uh, I guess like the only thing, uh, we can do is keep on keep on at this point I, I you know and try and get through it mitigate it as best we can and continue to open up the economy um, a quarter turn at a time like we've done and I think we've been successful in doing that uh, again if we could uh, if we could get <coughs> others uh, to take the proper uh, proper procedures and protocols and guidance uh, wearing a mask staying socially distanced uh, not congregating in, in large uh, masses and, uh, and just being smart about this. Uh, this is literally in our individual hands and uh, we would get through this a lot better, a lot quicker, a lot uh, without 
as much loss of life if we all did this throughout the country. So uh, again, uh, we're doing the right things here in Vermont, but uh, but we don't have um, we don't have much to say uh, as to what other states do. And and unfortunately, those other states, those other countries, the other provinces. Um, do impact us here in uh, in our tiny little state dramatically. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you very much, Governor. Courtney, local 22. Hi, my question. I was wondering your reaction to the news of President Trump and the First Lady testing positive for coronavirus. We know over the past several months, uh, Trump has made comments downplaying the seriousness of the virus as well as the effectiveness of masks. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, first of all, you know, we hope uh, there's a speedy recovery for the president and his family, um, as well as all those who are affected around him. Um, secondly, I think this can be a, a teaching moment uh, for, for everyone, uh, that this uh, doesn't discriminate, doesn't matter who you are, how powerful you are, uh, this can uh, bring you to your knees, so to speak. So uh, again, it doesn't discriminate and, uh, and we need to, to learn from this. And if we adhere to the guidance, like I was just explaining before, and, uh, and, and the vaccine is produced and safely distributed, we'll get through this. But, but we all have a role to play here. And it's really important for each and every one of us to exercise uh, that because uh, again, <clears throat> the actions we take will keep someone else safe as well. Sorry, I may have cut, been cut off or still muted in the beginning. I was wondering if um, Dr. Mark Levine could comment on that as well. Oh, geez, I, I wish I got to that part. I wouldn't have had to say all that. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Levine. Hi, Courtney, Local 23. I echo all the sentiments the governor uh, just stated. Um, and it is a teachable moment. That's, that's really all I can say. Um, if, if I could add one other item, uh, and this is not a, being critical by any means, uh, but again, reinforces my message about testing is not prevention. So um, embracing all of the preventive guidelines that we talk about many times, each, each press conference is truly prevention. Um, and I, have been told by multiple people, uh, both within and outside the White House, they do get tested every day there. And if you want to go visit there, you will be tested. Uh, so I'm quite confident that the president would have tested negative many, many days before he was positive. Um, but testing is not everything. So someone can still get COVID even if they're being tested every day. Uh, so. That's about the only uh, other lesson I would impart on people. Aaron, VT Digger. First of all, um, we're receiving, you know, messages from readers expressing a lot about Thunder Road holding its annual middle school tournament uh, this weekend. You know, given what we're hearing about this um, Bennington golf event and the cases that resulted from that, should we be worried about events like this going on in the future? Well, as long as everyone is following the guidelines that are put into place, uh, following the protocols uh, that we've asked them uh, to to administer, um, there shouldn't be a problem. I know that uh, uh, this, uh, the racetrack in particular, has been. Uh, been going all summer uh, without uh, any issues that I know of on, at the local track. Um, so again, it's always a concern. Um, there's always that risk. And uh, we just want them uh, to, to be sure uh, that they understand what protocols are in place and what guidelines we're asking them uh, to implement. So uh, as far as I know, uh, they're doing all that. But uh, um, but again, it's like any other event uh, that we're having here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a question about the um, weekly spotlight from the Department of Health, uh, which covers syndromic surveillance data. Um, 
it it is interesting as you mentioned that um you know we were kind of able to see the bump in people with symptoms of covid and that the covid case is actually rising uh, but it also mentions that people with flu-like illnesses are lumped into that same category for syndrome of surveillance because the symptoms are so similar. Um, with flu season coming, are you concerned that that particular way of monitoring cases could become less useful or harder to interpret? No, that's a great question. Um, early on, when we were showing our slides, uh, you know, months and months ago, we actually had two uh, pieces of data on one slide. One was called COVID symptoms and the other was called influenza-like illness. Um, but you are correct. The more we learn about COVID, uh, there's so many of the symptoms that can mimic what's in the flu. Um, so uh, we are definitely concerned about that. But we kind of know the general trends we see with influenza over many, many seasons and uh, the course, of the time course it follows and the time when it becomes most uh, prevalent in Vermont and when it begins to decay away, so to speak. Um, and so anything with COVID would be superimposed on that. What the true hope is, is that all the protective mechanisms we've got in place to keep people safe from COVID will also work to keep them safe from the flu. So even though it may be confusing about what one person's symptoms may mean, on a population level, uh, there may be less of all of those people with those symptoms because of the practices that they're already embracing to prevent COVID. We also realize that yeah. that's going to create a need, practically speaking, from the clinician standpoint of being able to test for both conditions uh, when that's appropriate, which may be many times that that's appropriate. And uh, part of the guidance we just sent out to the clinical community at large in our health alert notification yesterday had to do with just that topic about uh, dual testing when one's concerned about symptoms like this. So giving you a little more than you wanted for your answer, but I hope that was sufficient. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's it. All right, we had a few folks that couldn't get through earlier, but Quickly are on now. Eric, the Times Argus. Yeah, this is for Secretary French. For these assessments for the students and coming back to school, uh, what happens if they're all, say, six months behind? Does everything kind of get pushed back? Or if they're all over the place, how does that work? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was speaking generally about assessment. I think, you know, firstly to say that you know, teachers just as a function of good practice are constantly assessing uh, students and then modifying their instruction to meet their needs. So that's really what's beginning. Um, as, as your question, I think, points to, we also have commercial benchmark assessments available. Uh, so we have quite a few tools actually that are in, uh, in our schools at this point to begin to do that assessment. Most of those are not so much geared at, um, you know, six months behind per se, but they plot students on a specific growth trajectory. Uh, so it allows teachers, once again, from a formative basis to begin to uh, modify their instruction to ensure students can grow to the next level. So it's not so much about being behind, it's how to move them forward. So is there a way to know if when we get through this, say a year or two now, would we know exactly how much this impacted their education? Yeah, I think you're, you, that question gets to uh, sort of what we call summative testing or the testing that occurs at the end of the school year. Um, and that's still sort of a subject of national debate right now, to what extent we'll be offering uh, summative assessments uh, from, um, you know, in Vermont, that's the SBAC assessment. Uh, once again, districts have other local assessments they could use, but uh, we haven't, haven't decided yet, and certainly waiting for some direction from the U.S. Department of Education regarding to what extent the summative assessments will be used later this spring. Okay, thank you. And John Dillon, VPR. Oh, thank you. Um, Governor, in, in light of the, the news about the president um, and, and the what I saw in a recent debate with uh, an in-person debate, I, I was wondering if you think that having in-person debates um, are risky and if you would rethink that. 
um, and whether you should continue to have those going forward, um, especially when the person you're debating is the person who's supposed to stand in for you if you get incapacitated. You know, my preference would be uh, to do remote debates. Um, we've had a few of those, uh, uh, or I've seen a few of those over the last uh, few months with the primary and in the general. Uh, so that would be my preference. Uh, we did have one last night, uh, at, uh, as you know, and it was uh, it was handled well. Uh, there was a uh, health uh, type of screening done before. Um, a lot of protocols were put into place. Uh, no one was allowed in except the two candidates. We were spaced apart. Um, so in some respects, uh, they did everything according to uh, the, the guidance and, and protocol. Uh, but my preference would be uh, to do it remotely. Great, and, and I know, uh, you know, Tuesday seems like 10 years ago in, in 2020 time, but what were your overall thoughts on the presidential debate? Um, yeah, it was uh, a low moment in our history in so many different respects, uh, disappointing uh, and it's, uh, Again, I, I, I was a bit embarrassed to be an American at that point. I, I think we can do so much better. We expected so much more. Uh, and uh, these is the, the leader, uh, the two potential leaders of uh, the most powerful country in the world. And um, they can do better, they, in particular, uh, the president. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you on Tuesday for an update on the travel map and other models. Thank you very much for coming.